Good morning, OpenStack. Welcome to Boston. Please welcome Jonathan Bryce. I wasn't sure about that, that photo. I said, that doesn't look like me. I don't have that much hair, that mustache, and I don't play tennis. But rather than fixing it, they gave me a tennis racket. So, <laughs> so good morning, Boston. It's uh, great to be back here. Some of you may know that this was the place that we did one of our original summits uh, about five and a half years ago, October of 2011. We had about 600 people here then, and uh, it was very early on in the, the development of, uh, of the project, and here we are back here, thousands of people from all over the world. We have 63 countries represented, uh, a lot of people from China, Japan, the UK, uh, all over, even New Zealand. And it is something that is so cool every time we come to the summit and we get to bring the community together and we get to also add new people to the community. How many of you are here for the first time? Great. Well, welcome. We are very glad to, uh, to have you joining us. Um, so the best way to find your way around the summit is with our mobile app. And you can go to openstack.org slash mobile to download that. And that is, uh, it, it has all of the schedules, the agenda, it has maps, you can rate sessions, so a lot of information in there. If you do not like technology, <laughs> there's an analog version that is in your badge insert, a uh, piece of paper um, that will work. It never runs out of batteries, it's pretty convenient. And uh, it has a map, it also has an overall summary of the schedule. Just to orient you a little bit, because we are in several locations, um, across the week. Right now, we are in the keynote room in the Heinz Convention Center. Directly behind us is the marketplace and also a uh, primary lunch location. If you continue past that, there is a walkway to the Sheraton, and that is where OpenStack Academy, the hands-on workshops and training are, as well as the open source days. And uh, I know we have a lot of people here for this, um, this open source days component that, that we're uh, doing for the first time at this summit. Um, so, you know, these uh, these buildings and, and the primary floors here in the Heinz, uh, this is where, where everything is happening. The map kind of explains how that works. I mentioned that, you know, I love getting our community together, and it, it truly is a community. One of the things that we've had for several summits now is a travel support program to help individual contributors or diverse contributors who might not be able to make it to the summit um, be able to attend. And on the suggestion of, uh, of one of our community members, we actually opened this up for individual contributions. And I just wanted to briefly recognize the individuals who contributed to the travel support program to help other communities be here this week. So thank you to, uh, to all of you who contributed. And speaking about getting our community together, we are gonna bring back the Stack City uh, party that we started in Austin. Tomorrow night, we will be going to Fenway Park. Uh, that's just down the street here, a really awesome, historic baseball stadium. And uh, thank you to the sponsors that are, that are sponsoring this party. You might have noticed that the weather here is a little chilly, so you probably want to bring a jacket because most of Fenway Park is, is outside. Um, your badge insert, again, it has walking directions and transportation info on how to get there, which gate to go to, and you're going to need your badge to get drink tickets and, and food tickets there. So join us tomorrow, um, 7 p.m. It is, uh, it's gonna be an awesome time. So I wanna talk about a few different things today. We've got a great program. We've got uh, some users, some different companies that, that we're gonna be hearing from. But first of all, I wanna talk a little bit about OpenStack in the news. You know, if you follow OpenStack at all, you know that we are in the news a lot. And there is a whole wide variety of, of uh, viewpoints and opinions out there. Obviously, I, I have a, a fairly strong opinion about OpenStack and a, and a positive one, but I'm not oblivious to uh, you know, the, the variety of, of other opinions that are out there. In fact, I pay a lot of attention to them because ultimately what I care about is the success of OpenStack and, and our community. Uh, but you, know, you might have seen things like, like a tweet like this, OpenStack is as good as dead. That was actually from 2013. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a hobby. People love to, love to uh, make these comments and make these predictions, and they do it year after year after year. Um, but those are, you know, kind of opinions, and, and what I really like to base my plans and my decisions on are facts and data. So I wanted to start out with 
a couple of, uh, of updates to some of the data that we track at the foundation. We do an OpenStack user survey every six months, and we just recently uh, completed the latest one, and it had some, some amazing data in there. And, you know, it was, a lot of it was really positive, and there were things that we can learn from as well. But one of the, the biggest stats was that we saw a 44% year-over-year growth in the number of deployments that we were tracking. And that is a, a huge jump over every other user survey that we've done. And the other thing that's interesting to think about is, you know, we're seven years into this project, and we're seeing accelerating growth and accelerating adoption. And that kind of makes sense when you think about how technology, especially open technology, gets developed. There's a period where communities form, and we had a big community that formed up quickly, and then they start building the technology, and then it crosses the chasm to where it can be adopted and used for a massive amount of use cases. And that's where we are now. You know, our technology has matured, it's been put into production, and we're seeing a huge user spike in this adoption phase now. Of those deployments, What's held steady year over year is that two thirds of them are cataloged as being in production. So, you know, we're seeing growth in overall deployments and, uh, and a continuation of the number of them that are, that are in production. This was a, a, a stat that we mentioned last year, you know, 50% of the Fortune 100 running OpenStack. A new one that we have that, uh, that I'm really excited about is we have now cataloged over five million cores of compute power that OpenStack is managing around the world. And so think, think about what that represents as a global footprint. This is in over 80 countries that these deployments um, are running. Five million cores of compute power. It's a lot of work that's getting done out there on OpenStack every single day. And so this is you know, another quote that, that I, I kind of identify with. You know, we've, we've scaled, we've accelerated, we've matured, and, uh, and we're seeing a lot of growth and a lot of workloads moving into production now. But at the same time, you know, that's, uh, that's not the, the, uh, the only thing that I care about. Um, obviously, I think that OpenStack has a very important role to play in cloud today and also into the future. But, you know, there are always things that we can improve and ways that, uh, that we need to look at what we're doing and how we're doing it and, and what we should change. And recently, we had a leadership summit with about 40 leaders from the board, the technical committee, the user committee, and what we did is we got together and we looked at what's happening in OpenStack and what are the areas that we need to focus on improving. And we came up with five areas that, uh, that we prioritized. And to talk us through that and tell us um, kind of what we're thinking about so we can get feedback from everybody, I want to invite up a couple of our community leaders. So help me welcome Lauren Sell and Thierry Carrez. Good morning. Hello. So as Jonathan said, there were about 40 of us who got together actually here in Boston in March for this leadership session, which was very productive. We're thinking about the future of OpenStack, what the opportunity is, but also being honest about what are our challenges and what do we need to do to work on those. So today, Terry and I just want to walk you through what those five areas were and what some of the things are that we're working on in the community. So you can take those, hopefully, into the sessions this week and get involved. So the first area of the five is clearly communicating what is OpenStack. And we've definitely gotten a lot of feedback over the last year with the introduction of the big tent concept, um, also with the deprecation of StackForge, if you're familiar with that, which were kind of the repos of emerging projects on the edge of OpenStack, that it caused some confusion about what is OpenStack, what, what is actually inside the, an official OpenStack project and what is not. And to address this, we've more clearly defined uh, the list of official projects. We also published a new version of our project navigator. But going forward, we want to produce a set of maps to more uh, clearly clarify how everything fits together and see, for example, this project map, which is uh, a prototype, obviously, but which is a lot less intimidating than a list of 60 projects. Oops, sorry, can we go back yep. one? Yep. So the second area that we're working on is improving the feedback loop. And I think this is a pretty common challenge for most open source projects. How do you translate these user requirements into upstream development? And as a first step to solve this, uh, this week at the summit, we are introducing a new format for community discussion called the forum, 
Um, we used to have up sessions and dev sessions on separate days at the design summit. And with everything that was going on during the summit week, we ended up uh, only attending one side or the other. And uh, with this new format, everyone comes to the same table to discuss the same topics. So the third area we talked about is addressing complexity. And OpenStack is almost seven years old this year. Um, you know, it's a very robust set of capabilities. It's got probably the largest support for back ends in the industry. But we also continue to get dinged on the complexity of, of operating OpenStack. And this is something we're really taking to heart. Um, shortly after the, the workshop, we started to more actively identify areas where we can address this complexity in projects by uh, removing unused features or uh, pruning extraneous configuration options or uh, cutting projects that we are not going anywhere. Another perception concern that we identify is this view that OpenStack is an all or nothing monolith, that you have like, to install all the OpenStack projects or that you can't really plug any other technology in an OpenStack deployment, which is, if you think about it, a bit weird because OpenStack was always well, uh, an open stack. Like we always, uh, we always integrated lots of different technologies that were not produced within the OpenStack community. So the reality is that OpenStack is building blocks for open infrastructure. And you can use those together, you can use them standalone, or you can combine them with other technologies. And as a little teaser, we're actually going to see some demos along those lines tomorrow in Mark's keynote. We're going to see uh, Ironic and Neutron and Cinder uh, standalone, which should be a pretty cool experience and something that the community has been focused on and talking about this week. But we're also really working to collaborate with these adjacent communities. So this week, for the first time at the Boston Summit, we're going to have open source days. So we've invited these adjacent communities to come and have sessions, collaborate with the OpenStack community, educate on our users on how they can make use of their technology and get involved as well. But you know, it's important that we're not just inviting people into our community. We have to go into these other important communities and work upstream and collaborate. So one great example of that is the OpenStack SIG and the Kubernetes community, which you know, there's a lot of interest there with OpenStack users right now. And if, if that's something that you'd like to get involved in, I would encourage you to check it out. Um, the last area was uh, growing new community leaders. Over the last six years, our community grew immensely, and our focus was mostly on scaling our processes to cope with that explosive growth. Uh, now we need to focus on providing a clear path for new contributors to rise up. Um, we need to evolve our processes to be more friendly to part-time contributors, like contributors coming from direct users of OpenStack, uh, but also uh, evolve our processes to be more friendly to contributors in different time zones or different cultures, like our contributors from China. So the OpenStack community is broad and diverse, and we're in this for the long term. We're listening and we're evolving. It's, it's very important to us. So we want to thank you all for being here this week. The good news is this is open source, which means that everyone in this room can get involved and influence the future of OpenStack. So we encourage you to take these ideas into the sessions you're going into and to the conversations that you're having and, and help drive OpenStack forward. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren and Turgi. So I just want to reiterate that point there that Lauren made at the end. You know, this is an open source community, and things get done by participation and involvement. Um, so you know, this is uh, a summary of, of a lot of work that's going on in these five different areas. Love to hear what you think about it. And if you care about any of those, get involved with the groups working on it and help us uh, you know, make these really important improvements that, uh, that we're working on together as, as teams. So I want to move on and look beyond just kind of you know, what's happening in OpenStack and a little bit more at, at the industry. And I think that we are at a major inflection point in cloud. And this is really across the industry overall. If you look at, at what we're seeing, obviously, we see big growth in public cloud. I just put some stats up about OpenStack. We see big growth in private cloud. We're seeing um, hybrid and multi-cloud use cases actually move into the real world and, uh, and become something that people are, are putting production workloads on. And so we see growth everywhere. And you know, we, I said 44% for OpenStack, AWS growing at about a similar rate. 
Um, some of our ecosystem companies that are here, I've been talking with them, they're seeing 40, 45% growth in their businesses. So that seems to be kind of what we're seeing across all aspects of cloud. And as we look at that, you know, I think that, that some people, they might be surprised by that growth in private cloud. And, uh, and, and I've been thinking about that and kind of trying to understand what's going on there. Thankfully, I get to talk to a lot of users every day. And when I hear what they are doing with private cloud, I think that we've actually entered a second generation of private cloud based off of what people are doing and how they're doing it now. And so second generation, what was the first generation? I think the first generation was really around the time that we launched OpenStack. And that had a focus on kind of hyperscale cloud workloads. Uh, Rackspace was running a, one of the largest public clouds at the time. Early OpenStack users that were doing private clouds were like Yahoo, eBay, PayPal, that were also running it at massive scale. And the focus there was, uh, was really on, on very large environments. What was interesting, though, and what demonstrates kind of the power of open communities is as the community grew and people started to join the movement and contribute to OpenStack, OpenStack went into an entirely new set of arenas that public cloud couldn't or, or wouldn't handle at that time. And so in a way, you know, by opening it up and allowing everyone to participate, what we've actually done is we've broadened the addressable market for cloud overall. And I think we're starting to see the payoff with that. But you know, if you go back through and you look at some of the things that the community brought to the table, very early on in OpenStack, we had IPv6 support because we had users that needed it, and they came, and they did the work, and they implemented that in OpenStack well before it was available in public clouds. Geographical needs for data sovereignty, for regulations, for performance, for local laws, you know, this is something that has driven a lot of private cloud usage, but also we have about 30 public clouds around the world that run on OpenStack. Different hardware configurations that people need for various workloads. Um, NFV, this is one of the fastest growing use cases for OpenStack. We have telecoms all over the world that are building their networks powered by OpenStack. And Edge is a use case that we see emerging in a big way right now, and there's gonna be a lot of talk about that this week. In fact, we're gonna hear from Verizon in just a little while about NFV and, and edge computing and what they're doing with OpenStack. And so, you know, these are things that the community has done and that, um, you know, this open environment has enabled us to do together and to innovate in. And as I look at that, I really do think that we've kind of passed this point of, uh, of a generational shift in clouds, and it affects the technology, the adoption, and also the challenges that people face. If you look at the technology, the first generation was very focused on compute virtualization only. And now we see that everything is virtualized, the compute, the network, the storage, we're pulling in bare metal, and we're pulling in a lot of other technologies like OpenShift and Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes, and our user survey data backs this up. This is from our most recent user survey. We said, what PaaS tools, what container tools are you running on your OpenStack environment today? And this is the responses that, uh, that we saw. You know, this is not what are you interested in or, or kind of, you know, what's out there in the future. This is what are you doing today? And, and so people are combining these tools in ways that if you go back a couple of years, we certainly weren't seeing. On the adoption side, what we've seen is we've seen a change in the technology where it's matured, um, but we've also seen a change in the, in the user profile and the customer profile. And some of that is driven by it being easier to deploy, easier to run, at, a, at smaller scale and to achieve cost savings. Some of that is also driven by an ecosystem that has matured and companies who have found market fit for their products and, uh, and, and brought along you know, new users and new customers. And again, we look at, uh, at our survey data and what we see is a pretty even distribution across all organizations. Is it for big companies? You know, sometimes that's what people say, open is for big companies. It's absolutely for big companies. It's also for medium-sized companies, and it's also for small companies. And, uh, and this is, again, you know, something that, uh, that we've seen shift over the years. And a big area that we uh, have a lot of content about at our summits is, is around the challenges that people face as they adopt cloud. Initially, it was a lot about technology, talent, how do you find the people to run uh, a maturing technology. And now what we see are a lot of the, uh, the challenges that you face with any, any shift in technology, and that's around culture and processes and how do you absorb new capabilities. 
And we've got a lot of people who are, uh, who are covering those topics in their different businesses, and we're gonna hear from some great users today that are gonna share their stories about how they are approaching this. One of the things that I think is a challenge is our environments continue to become more diverse. A few years ago, what I would hear a lot of companies say is they would say, well, I'm always going to be in my data center. You know, I can't go to the public cloud. Or they would say, I'm cloud first, and I'm gonna put everything in public cloud. And those same companies now are moving beyond that kind of single focus and realizing that, that they actually need a range of options. This is from a Forrester uh, research report from the end of last year, and there's a pretty even distribution between this. Um, what's interesting here is you see internal private and hosted private makes up about 68% there. And in the OpenStack community, that's been something that we, uh, we've had a lot of offerings and a lot of deployments around um, that kind of fall along those lines. But one of those shifts that we've seen with the second generation is, is actually a new consumption model that has emerged in the market and that has been gaining traction, and that is remotely managed private cloud. So it's private cloud that is dedicated to you, but it's delivered as a service, and it can be on your premises or in a provider premises. So you can get that, the power, the um, long-term cost savings, the customization of a private cloud, but without necessarily being fully responsible for the operational model around it. And, uh, and that's, that's something that, that one of our users in just a few minutes, GE, is gonna speak about doing. So we have launched a new category in our marketplace today, openstack.org slash marketplace, to capture the uh, remotely managed private cloud offerings that are already out there, and uh, I think we're gonna see more of these over the coming year as well. When you're in that kind of environment, though, what I think IT leaders are gonna be thinking about over the next few years is, if I have a fleet of clouds, and they're in these different locations, where do I put my workloads? And as we've talked with users, we've kind of seen this framework that we call the three C's that gives you a few different attributes to look at to think about where should a workload run. And those are compliance, cost, and capabilities. When you look at these, you might have kind of an initial take of, oh, well, this is, this is gonna be public cloud, private cloud, whatever. What I think is really interesting is, as I've talked with different users, you see that these have variations within them by workload. Compliance, a lot of people think, okay, well, that's an easy, easy decision to go to private cloud. But uh, again, we have OpenStack public clouds like City Network in Europe that has built a, uh, a cloud that is compliant with European financial regulations. They have a pretty big customer, Folksom, which is an insurance company that runs on their public cloud and meets those compliance requirements. So there, it's not always just a clear, a clear break like that. Cost, um, you know, for public clouds, they offer a great way to get started, to scale quickly, but over the long term, we've seen a number of users who want to move their long-running workloads onto an environment that, uh, that they can recognize long-term cost benefits on. And we've had OpenStack users like uh, Adobe TubeMogul, Pubmatic, Tapjoy, most recently Snapdeal, talk about this. Snapdeal moved most of their workloads off of a public cloud onto a private cloud they built, and they achieved a 75% cost savings on their infrastructure. Think about if you could save 75% in any major line item in your business and invest that elsewhere. That's a huge deal. And capabilities, again, you know, public clouds, they are moving really quickly with a lot of great features, especially focused at, at the developer experience. Uh, but sometimes, you know, there are other capabilities that are required by projects. In Barcelona, we heard from the Square Kilometer Array, which is a, a massive multi-government science project creating a software-defined um, distributed radio telescope in South Africa and Western Australia. When it goes online, it's gonna generate 5,000 petabytes a day of data. Think about that. They can't just ship that to a central public cloud. And so, you know, what we see is that companies, they have these different workloads, and what they wanna do is they want to develop strategies and develop tools to be able to use multi-cloud as an advantage for their business, so that long-term they can build sustainable operating models, and also enable rapid innovation and agility in their development processes. And that's, that's what I'm seeing, and you know, what I wanted to share with you this morning. Thankfully, we also have a number of users who are here, and they're going to take this even further. They're gonna share their journeys in these different environments, and uh, they're gonna be able to, to help us 
um, gain some insight into how companies are making these decisions today. And first up, we're gonna be hearing from GE. So let's, let's hear from GE. 